birds, bats, and bees, fish, dolphin, and whales. They are dying around the world in record numbers. Is this a fulfillment of biblical prophecy? That's our topic on His Voice today. Mass animal deaths, another sign of the end. That's our topic today on His Voice Today. In the book of Luke, chapter 21, we have a very clear sermon given by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago as He sat upon the Mount of Olives with His disciples. He described many things in this chapter, and if you look at verse 27, He clearly describes His return. Verse 27 says that they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and with great glory. Now, not only does he describe the day of his return, but prior to this verse, he describes many apocalyptic signs that would take place right before he comes. One of these signs is described in verse 11, or a sequence of signs. In verse 11, Jesus said that there would be great earthquakes in various places, and famines, and pestilences, and there would also be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Notice this phrase, fearful sights, great signs would be take, taking place in heaven. Now, I don't, I don't claim to know uh, exactly everything that Jesus meant by this phrase, fearful sights and great signs, but I have a feeling that it does apply to many things that we can see around the world right now. One of these fearful sights certainly took place in the little town of Beebe, Arkansas uh, at the beginning of 2011. It was actually at the end of, two, of 2010, the beginning of 2011. It was January 1 when people in this small town woke up and they looked around and they were shocked to see uh, the bodies of approximately 5,000 birds that had just fallen down from the sky. They were on lawns. They were on uh, top of cars. They were in the streets. They were on the tops of houses. The media described this as a scene from a horror movie. Uh, the reports went out around the country and around the world, 5,000 birds falling from the sky. What is going on? Well, if this was just an isolated event, it wouldn't be so significant. But amazingly, uh, the very next day, another report came out about 100,000 fish found dead along the Arkansas River, and that had happened the day before, one day earlier, and it was about 100 miles away. So you've got BB Arkansas, and you've got the Arkansas River, so you've got the birds coming down, and then you've got all these fish washing up ashore. Well, that's just the beginning of the bizarre events that were taking place at that time and have continued to take place. Two days later, there was a report of 500 earthquakes in the same area between those two events. And believe me, people were spooked. And the media was on top of this. And they were, they were reporting about these strange events <clears throat> and asking, what's going on? Why is this happening? January 5, just a couple days later, another report came out on CBS News that two million dead, dead fish had washed ashore along the coast of Maryland. Two million fish. So you've got 5,000 birds. You've got 100,000 fish. You've got all these earthquakes in between the, the birds and the fish. And then you've got more fish washing ashore uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. Another report came out January 5 about more dead birds. Here it says, this is a, an article from MSNBC, the plot thickens, dead birds found in Sweden and Kentucky. First it was New Year's Eve, the article states, talking about central Arkansas and the birds that came down, and now it, the uh, disasters and the strange occurrences of birds, it just continues to go on, one after another. The plot continued to thicken. January 5, 40,000 dead crabs washed ashore in Kent, England. And here's an article that says 40,000 crabs joined the slew of animal death mysteries. Animal death mysteries. I tell you, the media was definitely stirred over these events. And here's another one. January 17, 10,000 dead cows and buffalo in Vietnam. And the reports just continued to come in. And, uh, people around the world, reporters, television programs, radio, they were reporting on these bizarre events that were happening rapid fire, 
one after another. And these strange occurrences have continued since January of 2011. Uh, rapid fire to this, to this very moment. I've got a list here of animal die-offs, and I've got 20 pages. And I've, I've read these, I've looked at these. Uh, it's not just Arkansas, it's not just Maryland, it's not just uh, Vietnam. The list just goes on and on and on and on and on. Peru, dolphins washing ashore, uh, other places where, where there's a whole beach full of dead oak, uh, orcas. And, and people are looking at these things and they're wondering what's going on. I don't know if you've heard about all of the, all of the, the bees that are disappearing, but this is a, a, major, a major concern. If the bee population gets too decimated, they're calling it a colony collapse disorder, a third of the food supply of the world is connected to pollination. And if any sizable amount of bees continue to disappear, uh, it could just uh, do uh, terrible things to the world's food, food supply. There's also um, evidence that the bats along the East Coast are disappearing rapidly. And, and the list just goes on and on and on. Fish, whales, bees, dolphins, birds. Uh, scientists are wondering what in the world is going on. And they're trying to figure, figure these things out. As I've read news reports on these different mass animal die-offs. I've read different explanations of, uh, of, how, of why these things are happening. Various reasons are given. Uh, but many times, the experts really say that they, they don't know. Uh, sometimes it's connected to weather patterns and weather changes, extreme cold weather that's not usual. Uh, other times it may be connected to environmental pollutions, poisons. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, conspiratory theories about uh, maybe the government's involved in this. A uh, lot, of, lot of ideas, and I'm not saying I agree with all these ideas, but I do know that uh, in the midst of all of these mass animal die-offs and the studies that are, are being done, that many times the experts are absolutely clueless. They just really don't know what is going on, why is this happening. Uh, they're continuing to study and to try to figure out what is happening on planet Earth. There's a number of Bible verses I'd like to direct your attention to that I think are extremely timely. They're significant. I think that this book has something to say about these mass animal die-offs. Uh, a number of months ago, I was contacted by National Geographic International. They wanted me to fly to Washington, D.C. and to be involved in a documentary about these things. And they wanted me to, to represent the biblical position, to, uh, to share with, with those that may watch the documentary uh, whether these events have anything to do with the Bible. Uh, of course, the majority of quote-unquote experts, they, they don't think so. They think these are just uh, natural occurrences. But a lot of people are really spooked about it. And there are many that do believe that these uh, bizarre deaths of so many animals and birds and fish and bees and whatever else, that somehow there may be a connection with Bible prophecy. I personally believe that there is a connection. Let's take a look at a verse, a couple of verses in the book of Job. Uh, scholars tell us that Job was probably the first book ever written. Uh, it was probably written by Moses out in the wilderness when he fled from Pharaoh. Uh, even though it's not listed as the first book, it is probably the first book that was written. And in Job chapter 12, there is a, an amazing series of verses that talk about the things that God has made, the creatures that he has formed. Verse 7 says, But now ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you, or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you, who among all these things does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. So these verses are clear that we can look to the beasts, we can look to the fish, we can look to the birds, and we can learn, we can learn things that God wants to teach us from his creatures. Ask the animals and they will teach you, the Bible says. Now obviously we can learn a lot of lessons by looking at the uh, creatures that God has made. There's a verse in the Bible that says, look at the ant, how the ant uh, gathers its food and prepares for uh, for the winter and how we, we don't want to be lazy, but we want to be like the ant 
and we want to uh, prepare ourselves for things that are, are ahead of us. There's lots of verses in the Bible that talk about how we can learn from the animals. And most of the time it's describing how we can learn by looking at them while they're alive. But what about from their deaths? Can we learn things uh, from their deaths, especially these mass deaths that have been happening uh, in, in increasing frequency, especially since the beginning of 2011? Well, let's, let's find out. Let's take a look at some other verses and see what the Bible actually says. Can we learn from the global demise of God's creatures? In the book of Hosea, chapter 4, there's an amazing sequence of verses that I believe have tremendous relevance to us today. Lessons from Hosea, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, and then verse 9. The Bible says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord has a charge against the inhabitants of the land. Here in this verse we find that God had a controversy with the people back in those ancient days. For there is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Now this verse is listing different ones of the Ten Commandments. Swearing is commandment number three, lying is number nine, uh, committing adultery number seven, bloodshed upon bloodshed is commandment number six, and God is listing how the people of the land were violating the Ten Commandments, one after another after another. It was just rampant throughout society. Now then when we go to verse three, look at what this says. Therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away. With the, bur with the beasts of the field, and the birds of the air, and even the fish of the sea will be taken away. And so what this verse is telling us is that when uh, society was full of sin and breaking God's law, the result would even ripple into the animal kingdom, and animals would start dying uh, in, in mass as a result of the breaking of God's law that had to do with, with people. Now then, if you go down to verse 9, verse 9 is a rather scary verse. Verse 9 tells us, that after the animals suffer as a result of man's sin, then it talks about the people, how I will punish them for their ways. So you look at the sequence, uh, God had a controversy with the land, with the people, they were breaking the Ten Commandments, the animals and the birds and the fish would be taken away, and then verse 9 says that people would be next. The millennium, will it be a thousand years of peace on earth? The age of Aquarius? or something totally different. Find out amazing facts about this often misunderstood topic of the Bible in today's free offer by Steve Wolberg, The Millennium. Order your free booklet today by calling 1-800-782-4253. You can also write to us at Whitehorse Media, P.O. Box 1139, Newport, Washington, 99156. Now, many people say to me, well, that was ancient Israel. That has nothing to do with our world today. But when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, the Bible is very clear that Israel's history, ancient Israel's history, is a lesson book for those of us that live uh, right before the end of the world. You can read it right in your own Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now, let's go to... Revelation chapter 11, and let's look at verse 18. Revelation 11:18 clearly describes an apocalyptic sequence. It describes events that are going to be taking place right before the end of the world. It talks about the nations being angry, God's wrath coming, the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that God should give a reward to his servants, the prophets, to the saints, and to those who fear his name, small and great, and then the last part of verse 18 says, notice, that he will destroy those who destroy the earth. The Bible says God will finally, at the very end, destroy those who destroy the earth. And as I look at this verse uh, about humanity destroying the earth, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that that is happening right now. Uh, I'm not a, a rabid environmentalist, but I certainly do appreciate uh, the world that God has given me. Uh, my, our family lives in the mountains in North Idaho, and we appreciate the, the beauties of nature. 
And as you look around the world, uh, increasingly uh, it is being just devastated by, by the things of man. I mean, there's just so much pollution, there's so much uh, waste, nuclear waste that is being pumped into the environment. I heard about a whole, a whole island about the state of Texas. It really isn't an island, but it's out in the Pacific Ocean, and they call it the Plastic Island. There was a book written about this, that the, the, somehow the ocean currents have accumulated all of this plastic and quarantined it in one area out in the middle of the ocean that, again, is as big as the, uh, the state of Texas. So it's no secret that there's a lot of pollution and corruption. A lot of this is fueled by uh, big business and industry that don't care about humanity. Uh, I, I certainly put people above animals, but as I look at what's happening around the world, and I look at mankind destroying the earth, and I look at the Bible, it tells me that one of these days, God is gonna say, enough is enough, enough is enough. And he's gonna step in, and it says, the scripture says, that he will destroy those who destroy the earth. And there's no doubt in my mind that the mass animal die-offs are connected to the destruction that is occurring because of the greed and the pollution and a lot of the, uh, the waste that is coming from the human race. Uh, and it's, it's a tragedy. We live in a polluted, sinful, uh, mixed up, crazy world, and it's not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse until the Lord comes and makes it all better. And that's the hope that we have. And uh, we'll talk about that more. We've got a lot to say about what is coming and the hope that we have. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not a train. It's, uh, it's going to be ultimately the return of Jesus Christ to get rid of sin, sorrow, and suffering. And we'll look at that before, before we're done today. But let's, let's look a little bit more about the animals, talk about the animals. Matthew chapter 24 is an amazing chapter where Jesus, back on the Mount of Olives, describes events leading up to the end of the world things that are going to be happening all over the planet. And in verses 37 to 39, Jesus said, as, as it was in the days of Noah, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of of the Son of Man be. Uh, these verses are very clear. Jesus is very clear that there will be some definite parallels between Noah's ancient days and the days on earth right before his return, right before the end of the world. <clears throat> That's exactly what he says. Now, if you go back to the days of Noah and you look at what happened in Genesis 6, 7, and 8, it's amazing that Noah <clears throat> built the ark, it took him 120 years. When those 120 years were over, the time came when Noah preached his last sermon. And right before he preached his last sermon, something very unusual happened. It was a sign. God gave the antediluvians, as they're called, the people before the flood, he gave them one final sign that the end was at hand. And do you know what that sign was? If you read Genesis chapter 7, it's very, very clear that the last sign before the door of the ark closed was a sign of animals. All of a sudden, out of the forests and in the sky, the sky was darkened because the birds were coming and the animals were coming out of the forest. And all these animals, two by two, seven by seven, uh, Genesis describes in a very orderly way, they went into the ark. And that was right before the door closed. And so as I've, I've pondered that, and this is just something to ponder, it's just something to ponder, that God gave humanity one last sign before the door, door closed. And that sign had to do with, with animals. They went into the ark, and then in a short time, the door closed. A sign of animals. And the reason why this is significant to me is because when I read Matthew 24, verse 37, which we just read, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be before he comes. Now, obviously, in Noah's day, the animals weren't dying. But nevertheless, uh, it's clear that God used animals uh, as part of his voice where he would speak to the people before the flood. 
when the skeptics saw the animals come in, they didn't believe it. They thought, ah, this is nothing. This is insignificant. There's, there's uh, nothing to this. But those skeptics were wrong. And in a short time, they were underwater. And that was it. And again, Jesus said, as it was in Noah's day, so shall it be before he comes again. Back to Matthew 24, the final sign that Jesus gives us, or at least one of the signs in Matthew 24, verse 14. And Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom, and the gospel means the good news, the good news of God's grace, of his love, of his mercy, of his kindness, and of what he did for us through Jesus Christ, that Jesus came down to this dark world and took our sins and paid the, paid the price for you and for me. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to, as a witness to all the nations. And then, Jesus said, then shall the end come. Uh, there is a day coming when it will be the end. That's exactly what Jesus Christ taught. There's, there's no doubt about it. And to me, um, as I've pondered this, it is significant that all throughout the Old Testament, ever since Adam and Eve sinned, what was it that God used specifically, uh, methodically, and purposefully to communicate to humanity the message of the gospel of his son? It was the death of animals. All throughout Hebrew history, the temple services, they would offer lambs uh, as, as sacrifices, and those lambs pointed forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. God decided in his infinite wisdom a long time ago that he would use the death of animals to speak to humanity about the seriousness of breaking his law, about the seriousness of sin, and about the seriousness of our need for Jesus Christ. Uh, and that certainly is the need that we have today. We need the Lord, I need the Lord, you need him, we all need him. I don't know if you have heard this story or not, but it's, uh, it's rather amazing came out of Argentina in April of 2012. It was about a husband and wife that were um, looking forward to having a baby. But problems developed and uh, the woman was not full term. She was quite a bit early. And so they took her, her to the hospital and she was trying to go through her delivery and things weren't going right. And apparently uh, the baby died and it was a, they said it was a stillborn death. And so they took the child uh, away from the mother and put, they pronounced it dead, the hospital pronounced it dead, and they uh, placed it in the hospital morgue. Well, within the next 12 hours, the mother and father, uh, after the woman was recovering, she decided, we've got to, we, we want to see our baby one more time. Uh, we never, we didn't even get to hardly see this child, this little baby girl, because they, she was taken away so quickly. And so they went into the hospital morgue, and uh, there was nobody there, but they found the coffin where their child was. And so, amazingly, the father pried open this coffin and then looked down at this little body with a, uh, a blanket over it. And then he pulled the blanket away from his child just so he could see his little girl one last time before they closed the coffin forever. And as he pulled the blanket off this little girl, she began to cry. And the parents were just absolutely shocked. And they found out the little girl was alive. She wasn't dead. Uh, as far as I remember from the news, news reports, five hospital administrators lost their jobs uh, as a result of that. And the little girl, the last I read, was doing, she was doing fine after being uh, nurtured uh, back to health. As I think about the world that we live in, as I think about the mass animal die-offs that are happening all around us. And as I think about something even more important, which is uh, the, 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 the struggles and the suffering and the dying of humanity. I mean, we live in a polluted, mixed up world that's just full of, uh, of poison, waste, toxicity, pain, suffering, sorrow, and death. And as I look at all this, 
And then I look at my Bible and I look at the signs that Jesus predicted, the fearful signs, the great signs, the things that would be happening. I look at ancient Israel and I look at how when, humanity, when society was breaking God's law over and over and over again, the result would ripple into the animal kingdom and God said even the birds and the fish would be taken away as a testimony against man because of man's sinfulness. And then I read in Matthew 24 that in the midst of all these signs that precede the coming of Jesus, the final sign would be the good news of the gospel, the good news of his love that would go to all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. As I think about that father who reached down into this coffin and grabbed his little girl, I mean, what if he wouldn't have come after her? What if they would have left her there? What if they would have thought that she was dead and never tried to get the coffin open? She would have perished. But the father and the mother, they went to see her one more time. And as I think about my Bible and I think about God and I think about his love, I know that God is reaching out his hand to you. You may feel like you're in a coffin. You may feel like your, your life is, is a mess and you have no hope. But I want you to know that there, you have a daddy in heaven. You have a father in heaven who loves you. And he's reaching out his hand to you in the midst of all the problems in this world and all the problems that you may be going through. He loves you and he's trying to get a hold of you and, and get you out of sin and get you out of all these difficulties and prepare you to live in a holy place, to prepare you to live in heaven with him forever. In Luke 21, Jesus listed signs that would take place. He said there would be fearful signs, there would be great signs that would be happening all around the world, and these things would take place right before, as he said, they would see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and with great glory. This book gives me hope. It tells me that Jesus is coming. It tells me that sin is not going to go on forever. The animals won't die forever and people won't die forever. One day Jesus is going to come. He's going to make it all right. He's going to come with power and glory to get his people and to take us home. You have just heard from this book, His Voice, today. We hope you've enjoyed this timely message from Pastor Steve Wolberg, and we want you to know that Whitehorse Media is deeply committed to bringing you many more simple messages straight from the Bible, designed to educate the mind, inspire the heart, and help bring our viewers and their families closer to God. To learn more about Whitehorse Media, or to watch more of Pastor Steve's television programs online, including his powerful new series of two-minute talks, visit hisvoicetoday.com. That's hisvoicetoday.com. If you have any prayer requests, you can email them to us at prayerrequests at hisvoicetoday.com. If you would like a free copy of Steve Wolberg's audio CD, Behold a White Horse, you can call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-78-BIBLE. We hope you will join us next time for another inspiring His Voice Today presentation with Steve Wolberg. Until then, keep the faith.